From London, the National Broadcasting Company presents War Telescope, a review of the war week and a forecast of possible developments to come. War Telescope today features John McVeigh of NBC's London staff, a veteran reporter of the European scene. And for his report, we take you now to London. This is John McVeigh pinch hitting for Elma Peterson on this week's War Telescope. The other day, I talked with a man who for years has worked against the Germans inside France. Night and day, secrecy has been his right arm, danger his blood brother. Moving about the country with false identity papers, this Frenchman helped knit together the strings of resistance into one vast web of hatred, of conflict against the Germans. He's one of many men I know whose brains and courage are waging pitiless war against Germany, a war in which no quarter is asked or given, a war for freedom. So little has been said about this warfare that sometimes we forget it exists. We tend to think of war only in terms of bombing planes and uniformed battalions. We don't remember that across the continent of Europe are men who are undergoing starvation, hardship, and the peril of death, instant if they're lucky, long drawn out, and painful at the hands of the Gestapo torturers if they're unlucky. Their reward is to see a German war train derailed, some delicate bit of German factory machinery grind its guts out on a handful of sand, or some German officer or Quisling fall in the street while the echoes of Patriot gunfire still sound above the tap of running feet. Let me try to tell you something of this secret warfare, as I know it from talking with the men who've been fighting it, men who tomorrow may be passing Gestapo men in the streets of some quiet French town, men who are helping prepare the way for the Allied armies in their task of liberation. I can tell you something of what they write in the papers, printed secretly and as secretly passed from hand to hand, something of their ideas in the future, their ways of thinking, their hopes and fears. Americans, still living fairly comfortable lives, can't hope to understand fully the depths of despair, the strength of hope, and the fierce single-mindedness that motivates these saboteurs, these thousands of men of the Marquis, who in part of France are carrying on open warfare with the Germans. Even the British can't comprehend how the foul pestilence of German occupation has governed the thought of the whole of Europe. What we can do is to give these men our help, our full sympathy, and an attempt at realizing how much they have done and are doing to win this war. First, they're giving up their homes and risking their lives for an ideal, even more than soldiers in uniform. To them, this is a political war. Either you help the Germans or you're against the Germans. That's the essential political aspect of the war. On that basis, life appears in blacks and whites. There are few greys. The socialist, the communist, the monarchist is judged only by his enmity to the Germans. The Dallons, the Lavals, the Paterns, and the Pucheurs, men who in peacetime party and program would be widely separated, are lumped together now as equals. They help the Germans, they must pay the penalty. On the side of the Patriots, there is wide agreement. Conservative right-wingers who've given up home and fortune to devote themselves to freeing their country think like and work with the men of the left, the disinherited who have only their chains to lose. After the war, there'll be a return to party politics. Men are bound to disagree on the best road into the future. But for the time being, the union of effort is complete. It may be that never again will the gulf between right and left become so dangerously deep as in pre-war France. Men who've shared such dangers together can never again look on one another entirely as strangers. The great gulf will lie between those in France who actively helped the Germans and those who took the straighter path. There'll be little patience with the big industrialists who made money out of the German occupation or the little functionaries who helped organize and staff the Vichy puppet state that worked for Germany. The Frenchman I was talking with the other day said the saboteurs may frighten those who look on the people as a dangerous and turbulent animal. The rest of us need not worry. Europe will purge itself of its traitors, and we may find new ideas, new methods, spread like wildfire across the continent. But the result should be a healthier and saner Europe in the world framework. The spirit of no compromise with the Germans or their French henchmen is a strong one. You've heard that the resistance groups are demanding the punishment of Monsieur Pucher, former Minister of the Interior under Pétain and now a prisoner in North Africa. If you were to read the underground papers smuggled out of France, you'd realize that most of them demand that Pucher answer for his misdeeds. One paper, La Vie Ouvrière, says, for example, on October 22, 1941, at Chateaubriand, 27 hostages were assassinated by the Bosch. The list was drawn up by Pucher. The next day, 50 hostages were shot at Bordeaux. The same men picked them out, and the composition was the same. Workers, communists, and trade union men. Toward the Germans, the attitude of the French resistance is no less clear. 
The hatred that Germany has brought to most of Europe is a lasting and bitter feeling. The shooting of hostages, the imprisonment of so many French men and women, and the forced labor inside Germany are seeds that will reap death for the Germans in the end. The French underground press passes around reports of the treatment Germany has meted out to Frenchmen. For instance, in the secret paper Liberation, you can read an account of the German camp of slow execution at Auschwitz in Upper Silesia, where 10,000 French men and women are waiting for death. Living on only a little soup and bread, says Liberation, the French are being used in construction work 14 hours a day. Three toilets must do for 1,500 internees. Clothing can never be changed. Prisoners living in foul conditions have lost from 40 to 50 pounds apiece. Among the women are 26 widows of French hostages shot by the Germans. Knowledge of these things bites deep into the French soul and strengthens the men who strike silently at night against the German grip on France. From one communique of the French resistance organization that relates to only one section of the country, let me give you a few examples of the work that goes on night and day. French resistance blew up a railroad bridge at Pau stopped traffic for 15 hours. At Lourdes, six freight cars of iron ore were blown into the river and the line broken for eight days. At saint Etienne, a locomotive was blown up on the turntable. A locomotive and 17 freight cars were destroyed at Pierre on the Chalon Dole line. At Lyon, a hotel requisitioned by the Germans was attacked. The hotel was so badly damaged that the Germans evacuated it. One German was killed and several wounded. At Toulouse, two German soldiers were killed. A French patriot was guillotined, and the same night, French resistors killed a German column, colonel, as reprisal. A notorious French spy, an agent of the Gestapo, was attacked in his home. The spy and two of his comrades were killed, and the house destroyed. And so it goes, a long, detailed list of what happened in a few days in one section of France. Yet all is not violence, certainly not thoughtless violence. The French resistance organization is discussing and thinking about the future in intelligent fashion. The study committee of the resistance groups is putting out political monographs that are worth serious consideration by political students. In political thought, the change in France has been profound. In the first shock of the German victory, the idea of democracy in the Republic lowered greatly in value. Then, as the French beheld the meanness, the inefficiency, and the spiritual poverty of fascism, both the German and the Petain variety, democracy recovered. The same change was apparent in the fighting French who are carrying on France's fight outside the country. Within the entire resistance movement is now sure that whatever France emerges will be a republican and democratic France, purged of the faults of the Third Republic. There's one factor that will be important in all post-war European political thought, the menace of Germany. For nearly four years, the Germans have kept millions of Frenchmen, Poles, Belgians, and all the rest prisoners. Their men who in ordinary circumstances would be the fathers of a new generation. Although reliable statistics are lacking, it's known that the birth rate in all these occupied countries has fallen greatly. The people of the occupied countries feel that the Germans are embarking on a methodical plan to thin out the neighboring countries so Germany can infiltrate and populate them with colonies of Germans. Allied statesmen have talked about giving Germany equal treatment and an equal share of the world's goods. In the occupied countries, such talk is political dynamite. If Britain and America should make the mistake of sending food and goods into conquered Germany before the allied countries have sufficient, we'll engender a bitterness that will have serious political reflections. I've talked about the underground war and some of the political issues of Europe. Now I want to talk about another kind of war, an open war in the air. With me are two American fighter pilots, the highest scoring aces in the American Air Force over here. Men of the underground movement in France have seen their Thunderbolt fighters streaking high over France many times in these last few months. Until day before yesterday, Captain Walker Mahuron of Fort Wayne, Indiana, was the highest scoring American fighter pilot in Britain. He got one German that day, but his friend, Major Walter Beckham of Defuniac Springs, Florida, shot down two to even the score. Each of these eight Air Force pilots now claims 16 German planes destroyed. Both have been decorated with a silver star and the Distinguished Flying Cross with bars. Mahuron also wears the Distinguished Service Cross. Is there any special tactic or any secret in getting such a high number of those German planes, Captain Mahuron? I don't think so. The main thing is thinking, sizing up a situation. It depends, too, on what you're going to try for. Before you leave your field, you can make up your mind whether you're going to look for fights when you're not with the bombers, that is, whether you're going to keep pushing. 
If you want to shoot down the Jerry's badly enough, you can almost always find them. And what do you think, Major Beckham? I think it's mostly a question of getting on their tails and firing so close that you don't miss. You don't have to be a great shot if you get in close enough. Did you two officers know each other at home? No, we met over here. One of the first times was when we both went to Buckingham Palace to have tea with the king and queen. That's pretty interesting. How did you like it? Well, use any superlative you like about that. The queen has a smile that says, come on right in and put your feet up on the chair. <laughs> I know there's a good deal of rivalry between you two pilots. Do you work together? Well, no, we're in different groups. But usually they use our two groups together in escorting fortresses and liberators on their bombing missions. We can check up on each other, though. I know I always read Beck's combat reports, and he reads mine. Of course, we read all the combat reports for information on any new wrinkles that Jerry may be trying. But maybe I read Beck's reports a little more carefully than the rest. Do you usually apply high cover for the bombers? Most of the time, but once in a while we come down and shoot up a German airfield on the way home. The lower you go, the more Jerry's there are in any hunk of sky. Once I was coming home in the formation of eight planes. We dove on a German airfield and shot up a plane on the ground and the buildings. And those airfields are usually stiff with anti-aircraft guns, aren't they? Did don't, you get shot up? Don't forget we were diving on the field at something like 500 miles an hour. They sh were shooting at us all the time, but we went right low across the field. When we got back, we found that not one plane had a bullet hole in it. What was your most outstanding scrap, your best day? October the 10th was a big day for both of us. We got three Jerry's apiece. I think I had the easiest job because I found a bunch of German two-engine en planes flying in formation and shooting rockets at our bombers. They looked like sitting ducks. My flight attacked them. The first one we went for rolled and broke away with the rest of my flight after him. I had the others to myself. I got one after another. They didn't seem to realize anything was happening until I'd gotten the first two. I found six or eight German twin-engine planes shooting at one long forward. I got two. The third was one of a pair. I shot all my ammunition at him. The other began shooting at me. I turned toward him and he ran. He didn't know I was out of ammunition. Then I saw eight or ten single-engine planes behind me, and I ran for home. You've flown 71 missions, Captain Mahuron, and you've been over the continent uh, 50 times, Major Beckham. How do you find experience as a teacher? My group has a total of 210 German planes. In that October the 10th fight, we got 26, the highest score for any group in this theater in a single day. Experience does count a lot. Your first few missions are always the most dangerous because you don't know what to expect or what is happening. It's sort of like walking into a crowded room. Then you get it all sorted out. About the only time we ever lose an old sport is when he gets over eager. But most of the time we are careful. We don't, don't want to lose good men in planes. The Germans and ourselves are always trying new tactics. Occasionally, we lose a man who hasn't flown for a few weeks, and he tries to repeat the same maneuver that got him a Jerry the last time. The difference is the Germans have learned a new trick or two in the meantime. Have either of you had the bail out? It's all yours, Walker. Uh-oh. I collided with one of our own B-24 bombers. It knocked off my tail, and I knocked off two of his propellers. He landed, but I came down by parachute. I saw the crew a week later. They thought it was very funny. It just doesn't sound so funny to me, but you never can tell about a sense of humor. Anyway, thank you, Major Beckham, and thank you, Captain Mahuron. Good luck to you both, and good hunting. This is John McVean saying goodbye for this week from London. You have been listening to War Telescope, a report on the war as seen from London by John McVean, NBC's veteran observer in the British capital. This program is presented each Saturday at the same time. And here is a bulletin from Moscow. Premier Joseph Stalin announced tonight, in an order of the day, that the Russians have captured the Polish cities of Lutsk and Rovno. The Germans admitted their fall on Thursday. This is the National Broadcasting Company.